Hi folks, my name is Phil and welcome to Expo Aviation. A little while ago I did an episode of Grounded on Islands Flug, the first airline that I worked for, in a roundabout way, and hinted at doing a story of my first day as crew. Well, today's the day. First, if you will, we need a little background. I was 19 years old and had moved from Manchester to Bristol for the job with XL Airways. I had been interviewed for Manchester and when they said the base was full but was desperate for Bristol, I bluffed and they called it, so Bristol it was. I ended up renting a house in the village next to the airport, Lulzgate Bottom, and even had the runway approach lights running right up to my back garden. It was perfect for a plane spotter like me. My training had taken six weeks. Five weeks with XL and then a short course with their Icelandic sister airline, Islands Flug. We had been trained to work on the XL 737-800, however, would need to undertake a conversion course onto the Icelandic registered 737-400 fleet, as it was the older Boeings which were going to be based at Bristol. The day was finally upon me to work my first flight as cabin crew. It was Wednesday the 4th of May 2005, and despite it being the small hours of the morning, I was wide awake, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed as they say. Actually, I had hardly slept as I was that excited. After getting ready and making sure that I had everything, I set off for the five-minute walk to the old terminal building at Bristol Airport. The airport had built a new terminal building a few years earlier and used the old terminal to house offices of various airlines and ground handling firms. The old terminal was right by the road junction so for me it was literally a case of crossing the main road then crossing another one and I'm there. Best commute ever. Due to an administrative error I hadn't been issued with an airside ID pass yet. Fortunately for me this was 2005 and there was still a way around that. Our acting base manager had arrived and was aware of the situation. He wrote me out a ticket, this ticket in fact. I would need to venture over to the passenger terminal and check in with the passengers to get a boarding pass and thus be allowed through. That loophole has been closed now. With a lot of airlines it's now a case of, if you don't have your pass by the end of your training, you're put on leave. Once that week runs out, you're fired. Incidentally, the same administrative error occurred to me again in 2008 when I rejoined the rebranded XL Airways. I got put on my one week's leave and fortunately got my ID. One of my colleagues from training wasn't so lucky and was let go. In hindsight, I was very lucky. I had planned to use my leave to book a holiday with my airline for late September and as you may know, XL Airways collapsed in early September. Anyway, back to that first day. Being a polite fellow that I am, after venturing over to the other terminal complete with my roller case, I then queued up with the passengers rather than push in. One of our agents saw me and brought me to the front however and I was given a boarding card for flight XLA 6224 to Rhodes. Security was a breeze and then I sat by the gate and chatted with some of the passengers whilst I waited to be called up. I was really nervous so I hadn't actually thought of speaking to any of the staff but again our agent saw me and walked me out onto the ramp and to our aircraft. My aircraft was a Boeing 737-400 registered TF-ELY. It was built in 1992 and initially saw service with Dan Air London then British Airways before moving to Islands Flug in 2004. This was one of two Islands Flug aircraft which had been painted up in the rather smart XL Airways livery. The crew were already on board having made the short walk from the staff terminal to the aircraft. There was a mix of Bristol and Newcastle based crew for this flight as it was our first year of operation for the new XL Airways base at Bristol. Islands Flug had based an aircraft there the year before, however it was operated entirely by their own crew on behalf of XL. This time it was XL cabin crew and Islands Flug pilots. The Newcastle base was longer established and their crew had already been trained up on the 737 Classic and thus they had covered the first few days of operations at Bristol while we all came online. I would be a supernumerary crew member for this flight. This was so that I could experience everything first hand but not have the responsibility of an exit door. Everyone's first flight is a supernumerary. It does have its perks though, as with no door assignments one has the chance to sit in the cockpit for takeoff and landing, but more on that later. During boarding I will be positioned in the mid cabin to assist with any bags, then with everyone on board and strapped in it was time for departure. As a supernumerary crew member I wouldn't be partaking in the safety demonstration so it was my opportunity to stand in the rear galley and observe. Sometimes naughty crew members would stand in the rear galley and make silly faces to try and make the demo crew laugh but I was well behaved, well at least for my first flight. 
We would have to do a manual demonstration every time too, as the aircraft didn't have any built-in entertainment systems. With the demo out of the way, it was time to grab our seats as we taxied out to the runway. I would be sat in the rear galley, and with myself and one other Bristol crew member down there, along with two Geordies, it was rather cosy. The 737 viewing windows are tiny compared to something like a 747 or Dreamliner, and just to make it extra hard to see outside, there was the red strap obscuring the view even further. This strap is there for anyone outside who wants to open the door. It serves as a warning light that the slide is armed, and if they do open the door, then the slide will deploy. With the window pretty much useless, we just sat there as we headed out to the runway, then listened as the engine noise increased. As we accelerated along the runway, we were pushed against our harnesses, and I was smiling from ear to ear. Once we were in the air, it was showtime. The girls put on their tabards, and I donned my bartender-style apron. We were trialling a new portable entertainment system called the P, or Portable Entertainment Appliance. It was like a portable DVD player, which had a fair few films, TV programs and albums stored in there. They cost a fiver to rent for the duration of the flight, and came with headphones. My first task was to take the half cart up to the front cabin and work aft with it, and hopefully unload the lot. Sadly, I did not. Throughout the summer we would have numerous problems with the PEA devices. Their batteries were unreliable, and while they were supposed to last at least four hours, they wouldn't. Then we had loads of duds too, so we were constantly having to swap them out or just outright refund the passengers for a defective unit. The bar service was next. I would be up front for this and working with the purser. She had been on my training course, but was actually very experienced, having been flying for around a decade, having started with future grounded candidate, Airworld. She had already prepped the full size, or double cart, in the forward galley, complete with a nice little display of snacks on top, as well as the bucket of ice. When you're up there doing the bar service, it takes a surprisingly long time to do. When it's busy, it easily takes the better part of an hour to get from row 1 to the mid-cabin around row 15, and then back up to the front, stopping along the way to provide more drinks to those who wanted any. While Natasha and myself packed up the bar cart, one of the Geordie crew did a quick clearing and collected any of the empties and rubbish. It was around this time that we were informed that our flight would be diverting. It wasn't an emergency, but more of an unplanned fuel stop. Our 737-400 was burning a bit more fuel than expected, and was going to struggle to reach roads without dipping into the reserves. We would be diverting to Thessaloniki on the Greek mainland, where we could top up the tanks. We still had plenty of time to work with though, so carried on with the cabin service. The meal service was next, and to be honest, we screwed it up. XL previously offered every passenger a hot meal on every flight, however, that very week saw the introduction of a split service. Passengers who had either paid the airline for a meal, or had one as part of an agreement between their tour operator and XL, would receive a meal. Those who did not would have the option of buying one for five quid. Unbeknownst to us, this only applied to what was dubbed a V-flight, in that the flight number ended with the letter V. The memo which our base had received hadn't been too clear on that, and thus the majority of our passengers would go hungry. On the 737-400, all of the meal carts were half carts so half the length of a full-size one, and designed to be used by a single person. It had two catering canisters, each of which contained the meal trays which had been pre-arranged with the cutlery pack, cup, bread roll, cheese and dessert. On top I would have a bright orange box, affectionately named a hosty box, which would contain all the hot entrees, or as we call them, hot bits. Normally the meal service would be quite quick as there is only one option on the flight, aside from the vegetarian or pre-arranged special meals. So normally you can hand the meals out pretty quick, but this time it took a while as folks were quite rightly questioning why they weren't getting fed, with several even going as far as getting their tickets out of the overhead lockers in order to check. With a few meals handed out, the rest were returned to the galleys and loaded back in the ovens. We had decided that we would have our crew meal on the way home, so planned on having some of the leftover passenger meals, though none of us had counted on having nearly a hundred odd of them. The tea, coffee and juice room was next, and following that it was time to clear in the meals, which for obvious reasons was also done pretty quickly. As we would be diverting, that cut our flight time down, but we would still manage to get all of our planned service flow done. The duty free, oh sorry it's not called that now, the tax free service was next. This was done with a double cart from the front galley and one from the aft with both working to meet in the mid cabin. Both had been adorned with a little display on top, 
Just an atlas drawer which was put on top and had a few items stacked on top of that to make some kind of display. The following year when I was at First Choice Airways we had a special metal frame which was affixed to the top of the cart and had a raised shelf for a better display. We didn't like those though, they were a bit fiddly and on at least one occasion during the summer one fell out of an overhead locker and seriously injured a passenger. The tax free can be a bit hit and miss, sometimes it's over in under 5 minutes, other times it takes half an hour. This time it didn't take particularly long and we were back in the galley within 15 minutes. It wouldn't be long until we started our descent into Thessaloniki, so stowed the duty free cart and secured the galley for landing. The seatbelt sign soon came on, as at Ireland's flug it was switched on at the top of descent rather than at 18,000 feet. I would be sat in the rear galley again for landing and soon enough we were on the ground in Greece. We parked on a remote stand as none of the passengers would be getting off here while we were refuelled. By now we, like most of the passengers, were feeling peckish and since our day had taken an unexpected turn decided to grab a bite to eat. In the back galley we started grabbing some of the leftover passenger meals. It was sausage and mashed potato with peas, carrots and gravy. I had one and then just started eating the sausages out of the others having decided to share with the number two who wanted the mash. At least it wasn't going to waste I guess. After the fueling had been completed, the active crew would perform another manual safety demonstration and then we taxied out to the runway and departed once again for roads. The flight over saw some improvisation from us. As soon as we were released, we got the bar carts out and did a quick drink service and then before we knew it, we were approaching top of drop. I quickly cleared in the empties and any rubbish and then strapped in once again for my second landing of the day. Despite the mix-up with the meals, the passengers were happy. Why not? Of course they had arrived, albeit a bit late. Rhodes Diagoras Airport doesn't have any air bridges, so we would have two sets of steps coming to the aircraft, one at the forward door and one at the aft. The passengers disembarked and caught the shuttle buses to the terminal building. Meanwhile, we had to get back to work. The aircraft was a hive of activity. The caterers arrived with their trucks and restocked the two galleys using the right-hand doors and an army of cleaners boarded. Some would vacuum the cabin's carpets using backpack mounted hoovers, while others cleaned and wiped down the tray tables and seats. Meanwhile, we would check that each seat pocket was free of rubbish and had the correct literature, as well as check that each seat had a life jacket underneath. Once we'd finished prepping the cabin, it was time for us to gather our things and get off, because we were actually going to be doing an aircraft swap. Our aircraft, TFELY, would be going to Newcastle and we will be taking a Newcastle based aircraft back to Bristol. Aircraft swaps down routes are a common occurrence. It's usually done to rotate aircraft between a maintenance base and an outstation. When I was at first choice we regularly swapped Airbus A320s in Malta between our Manchester and Gatwick bases. Notably, I remember picking up an A320 bound for Manchester which had quite a severe engine vibration and almost resulted in a diversion for us. Our new aircraft was TF-ELV, another 737-400 and was built in 1990 and originally saw service with Air Europe, then Dan Air and British Airways and then a myriad of carriers before reaching Islands Flug. Victor, as he came to be known by our crews, wore Islands Flug livery rather than XL and as the year went on would wear a hybrid XL livery just in time for it to be sent elsewhere with Jet 2. We would be swapping our aircraft as Vitzer apparently had slightly higher rated engines and therefore had a longer range than the other one. The runway at Bristol itself was slightly problematic for the 737 when near to maximum takeoff weight so the extra thrust would help. While I'm not entirely convinced by it, it was safe to say that Vitzer never needed to stop off for fuel on any other flights to or from Bristol during our summer season. Vitzer had landed before us as of course we had diverted. The Newcastle crew were waiting for us to wander over and take him off their hands. Pleasantries were exchanged and then we climbed aboard. I also had the task of lugging a catering canister over to the other aircraft as this was full of our crew food and we didn't want to leave that behind. Once on board we stowed our gear and were pretty much ready. The previous crew had done their turnaround duties so the cabin was good to go. We were going to be flying home empty. This was because it was the first day of flights from Bristol to Rhodes and since there were no holiday makers already out there we had nobody to bring back. This is why we were saving our main crew meals until this flight as we could sit in the cabin and enjoy them proper. As is often the case in aviation however things don't always go to plan and as we were getting ready to close up a car pulled up and one passenger climbed aboard. 
By strange coincidence, the woman was Icelandic but had no affiliation to Ireland's flag. We hadn't expected her, but that turned out to be down to her booking a flight-only ticket at the last minute and having no luggage. With a passenger on board, that changed things. All of the cabin crew had to take their assigned door positions for takeoff, and one crew member had to do the safety demonstration by the book. As a supernumerary crew member, I was able to grab a passenger seat for takeoff, so I picked one of my favourite spots just aft of the wing and lined up with the flaps. I wouldn't be sat there long, however, as before we taxied out, the captain called over the PA for any of us crew to come and sit up front. Needless to say, my excitement may have gotten the better of me and I hollered out and then sprinted up front. After a couple of false starts getting through the flight deck door, having been foiled by the decoy handle, I was in and then my mind went blank on how to set up the fold-out jump seat that the 737 has. Having given up on setting that up, I squeezed into the other jump seat behind the captain in time for takeoff. While I had been on the flight decks of a good dozen aircraft by that point, I had never actually been sat there for takeoff. It was awesome. Once we were in the air and the crew were released, I had a chat with the pilots before venturing back into the cabin. Since we had just one passenger, she was asked if she wanted a drink, and then to just give us a shout if she wanted anything else. She was happy just to read a book all the way home. The crew meals were divvied out. A hot entree, piece of fruit, a yoghurt, bar of chocolate and a sandwich. To be fair, the sandwich was to eat going the other way, but we scoffed passenger meals instead, as we didn't have time in the air. I ate mine from the comfort of one of the passenger seats as we'd all spread out around the cabin to have a rest. The assistant purser took the opportunity to complete most of the paperwork so we wouldn't have to deal with too much of the bar paperwork after landing and could therefore dart off home quicker. Soon enough it was top of drop and the skipper summoned me by PA. I didn't have to squeeze in behind the captain this time as Natasha gave me a hand with the fold out jump seat so I had an even better view. This jump seat folds out in front of the door, so it's pretty much on the aircraft centre line. It's lower down than the other one too, so you can see out of the windows properly. There was a spare headset as well, so I was able to plug in and listen to air traffic control as they guided us towards Bristol, and in no time at all we were on final approach. I could quite literally see my house as we neared the threshold to runway 27. We flew over my back garden and seconds later landed on the runway. The taxi to stand took a couple of minutes as we vacated the runway at the opposite end of the airport. On stand we shut down and then opened up once the steps were in place. We said farewell to our single passenger, grabbed our gear and then walked back to the crew room. With the post-flight paperwork almost entirely completed before landing, we only had a few things to fill in back in the crew room. I logged in on the computer system to see that my standby for the next day had been swapped to a flight to Lanzarote. Looks like I'll be back in the air right away. With that done, it was time to head home, and of course, that was only a couple of minutes walk for me, with me still beaming from ear to ear. Well, there you have it, the tale of my first day in the air as cabin crew. I hope you enjoyed it and didn't find that I went on for far too long, and that the pictures weren't too repetitive. If you didn't know, I actually did a similar video a while back which covered my last day as cabin crew. I released that to coincide with the 10 year anniversary of my last flight as crew and the final day of Excel Airways operations. If you've not seen it, the link is on screen and in the description below. Thanks for watching. I really hope this was of interest. Consider it a mix of one of my trip reports and the grounded all rolled into one. If you've not seen any of my grounded episodes before, these take a look at the history and rise and fall of various airlines from around the world. I've done over 50 episodes now and have covered XL, its predecessor Sabre, and more recently Islands Flug. I've got plenty more of these on the way, so why not subscribe to catch them as they land? And as always, thanks for watching.